just on a hillside, just above an extremely beautiful stretch of the Thames. Although this person lives on the river, they're actually much more interested in salt water and particularly devoted to the excellent work of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. So there's an RNLI collecting box. There's a very, very action-packed model of a lifeboat in high seas. And there are a couple of miniature lifeboatmen. But I notice there's also a historical angle here as well because this person has a definite fascination with the Dunkirk evacuation. A lot of the pictures here in the drawing room show an obvious fascination with ships and the sea. And here's another sign of an interest in history because that's a book on the little ships of Dunkirk. Now whoever lives here is quite a restless person, always interested in getting from A to B by the most unusual method of transport possible. So this person likes old cars and old airplanes. And that love of boys' toys contrasts rather strongly with an interest in avant-garde art. Look, a catalogue of a show by Carl Andre. Remember him, the controversial sculptor of the bricks at the Tate Gallery. Now, this is quite a musical family. There's a spinet here and an organ and something altogether more arcane. How often do you see a concert glockenspiel in someone's house? Now, as you look around this room, you can see many signs of an interest in the forces. Here are badges from the Royal Navy and the Air Training Corps. Whoever lives here is a person of irreproachably high standards. Most of us would shove a candle in an old Chianti bottle, but this person has a proper lamp made out of a magnum of top-class burgundy. Scale electrics must be one of the greatest British inventions of the 20th century, and it's just one of many fun things to do here in the games room. Now, as you look around the walls, you can see that the interest in the RNLI is pretty intense, actually. There are lots of very dramatic pictures of lifeboats. And the interest in aviation is very serious, too. Indeed, I think this person may even have flown with the Red Arrows. Certainly, he's someone who has traveled a heck of a lot, and on his travels has brought back an amazing array of souvenir dolls of the world. Just look at all of those. Now, this room may seem very relaxed. It is, in fact, highly organized. The library here is rigidly divided into categories. So we've got bookcases full of motoring books, including many biographies of classic racing drivers like Graham Hill and Juan Fangio. Then, of course, there are loads of aviation books. But what puzzles me is why is God's graves and scholars buried between a celebration of children's hour and a history of broadcasting in the UK? Well, whoever lives here certainly belongs to a sporting family. There are photographs on the bedroom walls that show that someone around here is a keen marathoner and a pretty good oarsman as well. Now, we know that whoever lives here is crazy about flying, so it's not surprising to see a magnificent Spitfire cruising over the bed. But how about this for a glimpse of futuristic transport as used to be? A model hovercraft. Let's look at the evidence. The Dunkirk Boatman. A life in the air. A fast invention. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, but not for our panel, here's whose house it is. About. Is it someone who is or was in the fleet air arm, which it, is the flying part of the Navy? Thank he goodness for that. He certainly was a flyer. 
Right, which is my father was in the fleet, I remember. If I didn't get that right, there'd be trouble. Um, okay, um, <laughs> yes, and now I think it's Ross's turn. Thanks very much, <laughs> <laughs> You're so nice to me, aren't you? <laughs> you know, it's a man. Well, Perhaps yes, I mean, there. that was great. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what I was thinking when I was looking around the house like the rest of us. Um, if they ever decided to hold an antiques roadshow near the person whose house it is, they'd keep the whole team going for about a year, wouldn't they? With all that stuff in that house. Yeah. There was some beautiful stuff in there. I'm going to hazard a guess that it, it, it's somebody who may have been a flyer but now perhaps has, has, has retained a passion for flying but also is perhaps interested in motorsport. Yes. Ooh. 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 Machines. Machines. And would this person... Oh! Uh, by repeating what you said. I think it was a man. And <laughs> d has he now become a sort of presenter of this? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. So we've got a man who's presenting things about machines. Uh, race... Uh, uh, vroom, vroom vrooms. <laughs> okay. car, racing car. cars. Car. <laughs> <laughs> racing car presenter. A racing car presenter. No. Well, no, but, but you're right that he's, he's been a very distinguished presenter, yes, and you see the, some of his interest there. That's, that's absolutely right. A presenter of lifeboats? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> is a lifeboat a hobby? No. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah, it's a charity. No. Yeah. No. Mm. <laughs> um, there's a spinet. Is that, is, that a, is that a spinet and a concert glockenspiel and an and a, organ? No. Nothing no, to do no, with... No, he doesn't present concerts. No. Russ, you're a bloke, you must know him. Well, I, I'm funny enough, I don't know many blokes with glockenspiels in their no. house, funny oh, enough. Who who presenters? Is the glockenspiel significant? No. no. Right. It's not Patrick Moore, That's Northern. the sainted Lloyd Dean Norton. <laughs> okay. Um, travel broadcasting, travel, machines. Not Jeremy Clarkson's dad. <laughs> no, 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 but he's of the same generation as Patrick Moore, probably. Ooh, ooh. Um, was he a famous racing driver? No. <laughs> I might burst into tears soon. Yes, Anybody? Uh, um, <laughs> is, is he a... What sort of presenter is he? That's what I'm trying to find what out. Is he, is he a... Um, does he present... Uh, he presents programmes, obviously. It's funny, because you said a children's hour book, and I wondered if he'd done some children's presenting. <laughs> obviously not. Well, Just sort of more, radio for, or more for grown-ups, though. Children radio love some of his shows. Radio or, or television TV. presenter? Television. Television. Presenter of... Oh, this is going to be someone who's going to go, oh, no. Of yes, course, you really are. We really Let are. Me, uh, Do you want to There was a all? reference um, uh, that Lloyd made there to the future or futuristic. Back to the future. Um, <laughs> space thing. Space? No, that was, that was when Lloyd pointed out the hovercraft. The hovercraft. So what yes. was the hovercraft? So, so the programmes, he may have been a presenter from the... So the yes, tomorrow's world. Yes. Raymond Baxter. Yes. Yes. Raymond Baxter, will you come to the keyhole? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice warm welcome. It's a joy to have you with us, Raymond. And, and let, the fleet air arm question, I knew you flew Spitfires in the war and so on and so forth, but uh, what are those buttons? Are they... Royal Air Force. Royal Air Force. Oh. Not fleet air arm. Not fleet sorry, air Sorry, sorry. I, I had apologize. many friends in the fleet air arm oh, well and still do. Good. So all is well. <laughs> Phew. Uh, yes. You have, not, you have not committed a gaffe at all. Thank how, God for that. How many missions did you fly on Spitfires? Oh, um... In terms of mission, I don't know, about 200 and something, I should think. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was lucky. I was certainly very lucky. Yeah. Now, after the war, you, uh, you were forces broadcaster <laughs> and so on. And how did you end up in BBC Outside Broadcast? <laughs> well, I, I, um, after a good deal of hammering on the back door of Broadcasting House, I uh, was taken on on probation to do the staff training course, which in those days was the University of Broadcasting, mm. anywhere in the world. And the visiting lecturer in outside broadcast technique was Winford Vaughan Thomas. Ah. And the t this will take you back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, the test piece 
was to do a commentary on an unseen black and white 16 millimeter film of the Lord Mayor's show. And I'd always been interested in outside broadcasts anyway. So uh, Winford uh, very kindly um, recommended me to, to uh, uh, the boss and uh, that's how it all started. Then it was 1965, wasn't it, in fact, when, when Tomorrow's World started, with, with which you will be forever, ever associated. Um, and it started as a six-part series or something? Uh, uh, yeah, a, a, trial, uh, a trial run of six. And it's been on the air ever since. <laughs> and the futuristic thing that we were talking about there that uh, gave them the, the chink at the end of the tunnel there, what were the... What were some of the inventions that you unearthed before they caught on? Well, there's so many, to be perfectly honest. I remember holding in <coughs> my fingers a, a little plastic card about that big and saying, this is the currency of the future. <laughs> yeah, I remember talking to Christian Barnard live by telephone after the first heart transplant operation. We televised live the first uh, hovercraft crossing of the English Channel. I was the only passenger. I was also the navigator and broadcaster. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course you went on doing lots of commentaries. You did uh, the funeral, some of the funerals, Winston Churchill's funeral, yep. and the Mountbatten funeral, which must have been a very sad occasion. Yeah, yeah, very, very moving. Um, but we had the happy ones too. Um, I did the coronation on radio in Trafalgar Square, that was quite an adventure because uh, we, um, shall I tell you the story? Have we yes, got time? please. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, on a built-up dais under the equestrian statue of Charles II in Trafalgar Square. You know the one? And there was a low balustrade in front of it and at the back were the gentlemen of the press with their cameras who were supposed to stay up there. But of course, as the excitement mounted and this wonderful image of, of the royal coach coming through the Admiralty Arch, all the pressmen came forward crowding me and the only way I could see was to lean over this balustrade as far as I could, like with my legs there, while my number two, James Pestridge, held my feet <laughs> so that leaning out like that, I, I could see what was going on. Unfortunately, James was carried away by the excitement of the mo moment, threw his hat in the air, letting go both my legs, and I very near wound up interviewing the lead horse of the Windsor Grove. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Well, that book about the broadcasting in the UK, you are the voice of broadcasting in the UK for many people, and this is the through the keyhole key that says thanks a million for being well, with us. Thank Raymond you. Baxter, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Raymond Baxter. Raymond Baxter. Now, I wonder who's next. Well, the best way to find out is to join Lloyd right now as he approaches house number two as we go through the keyhole. You can tell pretty immediately that this early Victorian house is lived in by a very enthusiastic, active, and outdoorsy family. There are plenty of golf umbrellas, there's a kite to fly, there's a walking stick. So they like being out and about and doing things. It's not surprising then to find all these baseball caps, but the rest of the hats here clearly reflect a globe-trotting lifestyle. There are hats from Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Texas, Russia, Australia, and a good old local English motorbike helmet. One of the walls in the dining room is decorated with some stylish black and white illustrations from the plays of Shakespeare. So maybe someone in the family is a bit of a performer or keen on amateur theatrics. Now note the middle row of pictures. Either they've been very artistically set askew or they have pretty wild dinner parties around here. Now family is obviously very important in this household. 
there are nice framed snapshots of various sprogs. And they're sitting on top of a very impressive looking piano, which is more than just a stand for picture frames, because these people actually sit around the piano and have family sing songs. They've got the song books to prove it. Books like 125 Great Songs of the 70s and 60s, and a book by America's once leading choir master, Fred Waring. So someone in this household probably comes from the States. This is a fine photograph of a solar eclipse, in this case, as observed from Baja, California. Now, the fact that someone here would travel all the way there to photograph an eclipse, coupled with the stars on the walls and a nice photograph of the surface of the moon, would show that someone in this family is indeed keenly interested in science, astronomy, space physics, that sort of thing. This conservatory has been turned into what's really the living room of the household. It's got this very comfortable, rather curvy sectional sofa. Now these folks love their gardening, but they've got a sense of humor about it. You can see that they call their garden the Garden of Whedon. In spite of that, though, they've got all the serious gardening books, and it really is a pastime that they enjoy. You can also tell that someone here is quite artistic. I like the arrangement of sunflowers a la Van Gogh. Reading is very important around here. This family keep up with all the latest novels. They've also got quite a lot of practical books, guidebooks, for example, and a huge run of back copies of the National Geographic. So globe trotting is part of everyday life here. You can also see more signs of that interest in science. They like technology. They're reading about Concord. And of course, they've read A Brief History of Time. Let's look at the evidence. A world full of hats. A talent for performing. A bit of stargazing. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, here's whose house it is. Debbie, it's over to oh, you. Oh, it's over to me. Oh, dear. Um, well, are we talking about a man? <laughs> I'm going to take my lesson from man about a man. <laughs> so we have an American man. An American man, possibly? Or an Ameri so it's an American I think, wife. I think the wife of the household is American. The wife is American. <laughs> um, and he is, the, he is the explorer. He is the traveller. She's the traveller. No, he's the traveller. <laughs> Would this non-American man <laughs> He's English, obviously. be um, well known for being on television to do with travelling? <laughs> and, not, well, and, and not on television for stargazing. That could possibly be a hobby, you know, the heavens and heavens. But I think that the applause there was slightly misleading in the sense that most of the travelling is done to get to places rather than you know, it's wish because you were of here. what he does it's when he gets wish, there. Not wish you were here, sort of thing. Anyway. Right. So he goes to these places to work. All right. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. All right then, Annabelle. <laughs> oh, <dear. No>. Clear <laughs> as mud, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, look. Don't you want to straighten those pictures? Oh. Oh no, I like going. <laughs> to go, oh, I like. I like going like that. Oh, it drives me insane. That was. Is he? Is he a performer? Yes. Yes. A performer? Obviously, they don't think so. They don't know. Um, he performs on television. Is he a correspondent of some sort? Sort of, yes. Yeah. Sort, of, sort of correspondent. Well, well, would, he be, would he be on a television programme that, that, is, that is well known for... Uh, it's an educational programme. <laughs> oh, well done. Oh, well, well. Ooh, ooh. Would, th would this man, who travels wherever he travels to to do his job, would he have been around for quite some time? And I'm, I'm not being rude about his age. You I are. mean, would he have been on television for a while? Would, well, would no, he's under, I think he's under, under 40. He's under, under 40. 40? Just under 40. Well, he's got a young family, because I saw the, uh, the play things in the background. He could have started late. Oh, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Something there knows under, when under he 40. started. <laughs> well, under 40 with young children, that could be That's James anybody Burke out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he is a presenter on TV. 
Yeah. Is it young Jeremy Clarkson? It could be, but it isn't. Oh, but it's someone like that. Because he's always filling his expenses. Yes, it's a, it's a good... It's a good guess. Someone uh, like Jeremy that. Jeremy Paxton? No. It's, it's that kind of thing, though, isn't it, David? Yes, you're, you're so, look, so we've got Shakespeare. Is Shakespeare relevant? No. Not really. No, it's nonsense. Not it's just really. to annoy me having the pictures there. <laughs> Piano. Eclipse. Oh. Stars, moon. Moon, stars. So well, it's just been given... I don't think you're going to get this because of the subtlety with which he has been chosen here because oh. he it is the person who was from 1985 until 1997 presenter of tomorrow's world oh, Howard yeah. Stapleford oh. will you come through the keyhole Tough. It was tough. Very yes, few clues, very, I think. Very few clues. And uh, congratulations on beating the panel. The, we, uh, <laughs> oh. we foxed them. We foxed, foxed them there. Totally Were there foxed. any clues that they missed, do you think? Well, not really. I think uh, because, as you can see, who sort of makes my home is my wife. Yeah. So there's, there's a sort there's of... There's not her. a trace of you there, is And there? I, I was the, the only clue... <laughs> the only clue is that I was the one that tilted the pictures. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I could never have anything to do with you. <laughs> it's all off. But no, that is unique. I've never seen that before. I must say. What happened, and Lloyd was right, right about this, we did have this particularly uh, <laughs> loud dinner party, <laughs> and they were all straight. And one party guest said, I can't bear that anymore. Oh. And she was the one that got, got up and did that, and we liked it, and we kept it that way. I actually, think it's great. It? I love it. Yeah, I <laughs> think it's very, very creative, because first of all, you think it's a mistake, and then you realise it isn't. I think it's, my it's wife, unique. I think you should copyright says, it. My wife's an accountant, Just which is, explains why they were all ordered like that in the first place. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> did you, we were asking Raymond earlier on, um, did you have favourite inventions that you unearthed on tomorrow's world? I think one of my favourite was definitely some very serious research being done by Moite Chandon, the champagne makers, who <laughs> are putting a lot of research into making the bubbles in their champagne of a uniform size. Yes, oh really. good. Yeah, and I think they're still working on it, because evidently you just don't want champagne with different size bubbles. No, in. Well, very yeah. distressing. So I went all the way to FNA in France to, to do this story, and yeah. very pleased I did, really. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the highlights. <laughs> yes, yes, there, was, there were compensations there. And you had, among your Perhaps you had a glove with eight fingers, didn't oh you? Oh, yeah. That was a, we, we sort of piloted a show um, about inventors, garden shed inventors. And one lad in Yorkshire came along, uh, sat in the audience, and we went into the audience and s to see what people had. And he'd invented a glove with eight fingers so that lovers could hold hands in the winter. Aww. 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 All together, please. Aww. Aww. It's lovely. It is oh, lovely. Yeah. A little moment, magic moment yeah. of romance yeah. in the middle of the programme. Oh. Got yeah. nowhere, of course. Nobody backed it. No. Down, <laughs> the, down the tube. Down the pan. And now you're working, working up deals in Russia, I gather. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, uh, we, I set up a, a Russian television company to syndicate the BBC programmes around Russia. And this was a fantastic out-of-body experience in many ways because I'd be doing Tomorrow's World. I'd fly to Moscow with my briefcase, stride across Red Square to business meetings thinking, what the heck am I doing? I'm a Tomorrow's World presenter. And then we'd have simultaneous translation meetings with heads of televisions from the whole of Russia um, to try and sell BBC programmes over there because I had contacts. That it was just the right time, the right place. But it all got a bit heavy with the Mafia. Oh, really? Yes. And we nearly fell in with a, a group who I better not name, just in case they watch this in Russia, oh, um, who were really not people that we should have been working yeah. with. And in the end, we, we folded it because it was costing us an arm and a leg just to be there, to, to pay what they call the roofers. The Mafia over there <laughs> call themselves, you need roofing. We, oh. had a, we had a basement office. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but we had to pay the roofers 2,000 US a month. And, you know, it all just became... Genteel form, not very genteel form of protection. Exactly, right? yeah. Well it's, well, it's great fun to have you with us, Howard, I must say. And this is the Through the Keyhole Key, which is our way of saying thanks a million. Well, thank you. And thank you for the new decorating idea of the, <laughs> of the wonky pictures. The nation pictures. will do it now. Yeah, the nation will take, take their stand from that. Howard Stableford, thank you so much. Thank you. Howard Stableford and Raymond Baxter. What a dream team. And a dream team over there too. Annabelle, Russ and David. Until the next time.